You're listening to Seize Your Adventure, the podcast that shares stories of adventure and outdoor living with epilepsy. In those circumstances, running on more isolated trails meant I was alone and no one stopped to help me. I never questioned that or hoped for anything else because I knew once I woke up that I would be able to get myself home. Here I go on my way to where the wild things grow and I know there'll be good times, bad times on the road where the wild things grow where a soul can be a soul Hello adventurers, Fran here, and it has been a long time coming, but I have a new story of adventure for you. I'm sorry that it's been so long since the last story, but this type of episode is very labour intensive. And for those of you that follow my 30 at 30 for epilepsy challenge, you'll know I've been a bit busy recently. I will go into more detail in a future podcast for you, but about a week ago I ran not one, but two ultra marathons over a weekend. And I can tell you 100 kilometres is an insane distance. It was an incredible experience and an emotional one, but training for that, fundraising and recovering from the race has taken up a lot of time over the past couple of months. And I know the podcast has been on the back burner at times because of it. So I am very excited to come back with what is in fact a brand new story for you. It hasn't been posted anywhere on the Seizure Adventure website or anywhere else online and has been written entirely for this podcast, which is quite exciting, to be honest. It makes me feel like a proper podcaster now. And it is a very fitting story because it looks at the idea of how we define ourselves, and it comes from another runner with epilepsy. For most people, the teenage years are a crucial period in finding out who we are. We try out lots of new things, we meet new people, we're growing into new bodies, and we're starting to figure out the adult we will become. So it's horribly ironic that the teenage years are also a time that a lot of people start experiencing seizures for the first time. Today's story comes from Amanda Plump. Nowadays, Amanda defines herself as a runner, and specifically as a runner with epilepsy. But that wasn't always the case. When Amanda started having seizures in her teens, it made her feel lost in her own body. Those seizures, and the medication to stop them, impacted on the activities that she enjoyed. She felt defined by having the condition, but after many years of living with epilepsy, something unexpected helped Amanda reconnect with her body and redefine her sense of self. Now, there are a couple of key words I just want to give you to help you enjoy the story better. Tonic-clonic seizures we're now familiar with. Those are the ones where you lose consciousness and convulse. Myoclonic seizures or myoclonic jerks are isolated convulsions in one part of your body. So it might be a jerk of the arm or leg, for example. And there is the very complicated sounding juvenile myoclonic epilepsy of Jans. That's Amanda's diagnosis, and basically it just means epilepsy with different types of seizure, including those myoclonic jerks, and it starts before you're an adult. Now that we have that knowledge, I'd like to let Amanda tell you more. I didn't consider myself athletic when I was young, but I was always active as a kid. I played softball, I went swimming, I went camping... I hiked, I climbed, I rode a bike, I snowboarded and skied. I tried a lot of different sports, from hockey and soccer to long jump. But there was nothing that made me wake up in the morning and leap out of bed to get going. I didn't love sport. And then there came a time when I stopped doing sport at all. I was 13 years old when I started exhibiting signs of seizures. 
They were occurring fairly early in the mornings, but with no one else in my family having epilepsy, there was no reason to think anything along those lines. I was lethargic and tired, but surely that was because I was a teenager going through puberty. I was temperamental, but surely I had always kind of been that way? It was my teachers who noticed the change the most, as I went from an enthusiastic, lively student to appearing to daydream all the time, especially in the mornings. It turned out they assumed I was on drugs, but they said nothing to my parents or to myself about it. It was the day after my 14th birthday, I had my first known tonic-clonic seizure. I was getting ready for school. I remember noticing a clenching sensation in my right hand and arm. For about 10 seconds, I felt it spasm. I couldn't understand what was happening, and then nothing. I was hospitalized by that seizure, but no diagnosis came of it. No one saw exactly what had happened. I didn't even know the words or the medical condition to be able to verbalize my experience. I couldn't explain it. A few months later, I collapsed in the shower. My dad had to pull me out. It was by far the most embarrassing moment of my life, even to date. Honestly, being a teenage girl is challenging enough. Having to have your dad pull you out of the shower is the worst. At least, though, the seizure was witnessed. After that, the episodes increased, and I began seeing doctors and specialists. I was eventually diagnosed with something called juvenile myoclonic epilepsy of Jans. I don't remember feeling anything through the testing, through the appointments, but I do remember being so angry at the neurologist who was sitting there and telling me that I would probably never graduate high school, never have professional employment, never be able to live independently, no driving, no travel. My condition would make relationships difficult. I would never have a family. I don't know what my parents were thinking or feeling in the moment. That neurologist wasn't just giving me a diagnosis. He was saying no to everything I had anticipated for the rest of my life. He was saying, you can't do this. And I was mad. I would love to say that I just went forward and showed everyone he was wrong right off the bat. That was not the case. I was angry, but I began very quickly to realize that there was more potential limitations than just the diagnosis of epilepsy. The first round of medications caused significant weight gain and increased appetite. My slender, prepubescent body was now suddenly several clothing sizes bigger. When I showered, I would come out with handfuls of my long hair, which was falling out in massive clumps. I was exhausted. My body, which was already transitioning from being a child to being sort of an adult, was now having to endure seizures and pharmaceutical side effects as well. School became torture. I couldn't focus, whether reading, another hobby I loved, or having a conversation. My grades, something I'd always taken a lot of pride in, dropped drastically because understanding didn't come naturally or immediately to me anymore. My friends left me, saying I was faking the seizures for attention. None of the teachers wanted me in their classes because I was disabled and they didn't know how to deal with that. My physical education class would go swimming, and I had to stay out of the pool and write a report about swimming, just to remind me what I was missing. I became insecure. I tried to isolate myself. I was aggressive and angry. And I dropped out of all of my sports. The neurologist was being proved right, not because of just the diagnosis of epilepsy, but because of all the side effects that came with it. But when I mentioned earlier that I was temperamental as a kid, I wasn't joking. If someone tried to tell me to do something, I refused, just on the principle that I hadn't been asked. I argued with everyone about everything. I am still kind of this way, honestly. 
But certainly 14-year-old me was not having any of the no that I was hearing. Because I was told I probably would not graduate high school, I had to. It took extra effort, and I went through five different schools in five years. But I graduated on time. And then I went on to obtain two separate Bachelor of Arts degrees. While I was in university, I was able to leave the epilepsy label behind me, and with it some of the isolation and insecurities. I still had seizures, but I also studied overseas on two occasions. I backpacked internationally, I traveled, I saw the world. But I didn't wear a medic alert bracelet or tell anyone that I had epilepsy. I managed to hide it from everyone, even family, roommates, and travel partners. I wasn't as scared of the seizures as I was scared that people would judge me or leave me, like my middle school friends had. That was a major reason why I didn't get back to sports in university. Sure, I loved hiking and camping. That's kind of a standard Canadian summer pastime, so it never stopped. And I would very occasionally go to the gym or organize a road trip and hike for international students. But those commitments were specific to me, with no one relying on me. I was afraid that if I became part of a sporting team, I wouldn't be able to guarantee that I would be able to attend practices or games. I did not talk about my epilepsy with even those closest to me. I certainly wouldn't want to try to explain it to an entire team. So I carried on avoiding sport out of fear. After I graduated from university, I ended up with an employer in Calgary, not far from the foothills of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. My office was just down the block from the Bow River Parkway, which is, in my opinion, the most beautiful place in Calgary. The parkway goes along the Bow River, a wide river fed by turquoise glacial waters. The paths inside the parkway are predominantly pavement, but the trees and pine forests on either side make it feel like you are outside the city, not right in the core. If you go out after dusk or early in the morning, there are deer, and during the day there are always small animals and Canadian geese. Working close to the park, I realized I wanted to be outside. I wanted to be active. I had lost weight a few years prior due to a medication that I was no longer on, but I didn't feel strong. I still felt a little bit lost in my body. Since the time that the seizures had started, I hadn't been able to feel comfortable with who I was physically. I wanted to be active. <laughs> I needed to be active, but I was dirt poor. So despite the fact that Calgary has very cold weather and a lot of gyms, I started running outside because I thought it would be inexpensive. At lunch hours, I would change into cheap sneakers and go for a run along the River Parkway. It started as barely being able to hold a pace for a minute. My lungs would be breathless, my legs would get tired. But over time, that one minute turned into five minutes, then 10. Those first runs, I wasn't able to run solidly for an entire kilometer, but eventually I started being able to add distance during my lunch breaks. And one day, after months, I suddenly realized I didn't want to go back to the office at the end of my lunch because I wasn't done running. I wasn't done running. I wanted to go further. I, I had to go further. But being the mature, responsible adult that I am, I turned around and went back to work, buzzing. After that point, though, I started running in the evenings as well. I started adding on more kilometers and more hours. I spent my weekends in the provincial parks seeing how far I could run and at what point I would have to stop. Those protected areas of nature gave me a variety of running experiences. Pavement, pack trails, backwood. I loved the backwoods running and often climbing as well, but because I ran alone, I didn't feel as safe, knowing a seizure could happen, and the larger wildlife that are in the parks, moose, bears, and mountain lions share those trails. 
I got used to the pavement and the pack trail and learned that pack trail is my favorite. I bought a running watch, a running belt, proper running shoes. I started reading books and magazines on running. I didn't change my terrible eating and drinking habits, but I did notice the increase in my lung capacity, in my muscles, and in my ability to endure and keep going. I loved running. But the seizures. I was still having seizures. And I had seizures while I was running. Sometimes they were myoclonic seizures, and a random jerk or twitch meant I would trip. But if I didn't land too hard or hit anything, I could get up and keep going. That was just the way it was. I did have occasional tonic-clonic seizures while running. Because I have no identified triggers and experience no auras, I would just wake up on the ground. I would look at my running watch, realize there was no way that my running time could be that much, and I would know that I'd had a seizure. In those circumstances, running on more isolated trails meant I was alone and no one stopped to help me. I never questioned that or hoped for anything else because I knew once I woke up that I would be able to get myself home. Here I go On my way to where the wild things grow And I know There'll be good times, bad times on the road Where the wild things grow Where a soul can be a soul In 2017, I did my first international race combination. It was a 10K at 5.30 a.m. on a Saturday morning and a half marathon at 5.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning. When I was chatting with people at the race, I learned that a lot of people were running for different causes. Sometimes people had the conditions themselves. Sometimes they were supporting people they knew. I realized that, more so than when I was a teenager, there were people willing to fight the stigmas and support others with different conditions. I was so impressed by the strength and passion I saw that when I came back to Canada, I immediately started a blog and began reaching out to organizations in the epilepsy community. I wanted to fight the stigma associated with invisible disabilities, and I wanted to support others. It has been seven years since I started running, and from that slow one kilometer, I can now run ultra distances beyond a marathon. I have raced across mountains and through Disneyland. I have flown from country to country, chasing 10Ks and half marathons and marathons. I didn't realize it when I started, but by long distance running, I was teaching my body how to be strong and endure. Not just the specific strength that comes from being able to propel myself forward for 42.2 kilometers, but actually strong body and soul. The injuries I've experienced, stress fractures, nerve damage, cuts, bruises, strains, and sprains, for me, they're all just part of running. Running is mentally exhausting. You're in your brain for a few hours, pushing your body to keep moving, when the only break in a race is the next water station, where you absently accept a cup of water, suck an electrolyte gel, and keep stumbling forward. The station is out of sight so quickly, it might not have even been there. There are other runners around you, but you don't know them. They don't know you, or what conditions you may run with. My epilepsy has helped me with my running. Seizures have resulted in more injuries than I could ever obtain running, and I know my capacity for pain, what it's like to feel overwhelmed, to lose focus. It is meant too that when I run and I feel like I can't keep going, that there have been so many other times outside of my control when I have felt that way. And yet I managed, I persevered. Being a runner has helped me with my seizures. I recover fast, I am more aware of my muscles, of where the pain is located, of what I need to do to get back into my sneakers after a seizure. The road to recovery is something that I think most runners are aware of to keep themselves healthy and I've simply applied it to other healing. And becoming an athlete has helped me with my epilepsy. If I wake up after a seizure, I might be upset, but I'm not devastated. I do a quick assessment, scan of myself, review any injuries, and then I get back up. It's the knowledge that I wanted to get back up that keeps me there. In my mind, knowing that I have previously been able to stand up and keep going empowers me to get up again. As a runner, I want to go further and faster. As an epileptic, I know I can, even in the face of adversity.
I am a runner was written and read by Amanda Plump, who is of course a runner, but also a blogger and an epilepsy advocate based in Victoria in Canada. And she blogs about being a runner and athlete with epilepsy under her website, Tremors of My World. That link is in the show notes for you. There are many people who question the decision to run alone in the backwards if you're likely to have a seizure. And the dangers and responsibility of running with epilepsy was something Amanda and I talked about in detail when we had a chat a few weeks ago. My seizures, depending on the length of time or when someone finds me, a bracelet that says epilepsy isn't really going to be very helpful. Um, if I'm unconscious on the pathway and somebody comes across my body, if they don't see the seizure, it's, I would hope they would call 911 if they came across me just to call for an ambulance, but I'd be more at risk for a concussion if I was unconscious on the pathway rather than having had a seizure, um, as a result. The, um, the worst thing I think would be actually is if I, if I fall, if I just have like a little myoclonic seizures and I trip, I usually scrape up my, my knees from my kneecaps just to like the whole length of them. And it's painful, but it's not the end of the world. And if I'm bleeding, I can still run if I'm, if I'm in training and I can usually just get up and keep going. The problem is, is that over the next few weeks when it starts to like heal and then crack again because I keep running and then it starts bleeding again and then it heals and then cracks. It's just such a process. It's so, you know, inconvenient. (laughs) Yeah, that's making me remember sometimes when I was a teenager uh, and just clumsy, I think. Uh, (laughs) Definitely skidded skidded my knees on some tarmac and that kind of thing a fair few times and yeah I remember that feeling oh yeah but I mean I'm as much at risk of tripping and falling like just over uneven sidewalks or roots or rocks or anything like that as anybody else so no matter what that that's a risk that anyone who goes outside I think has to take yeah absolutely You'll get to hear more of our conversation in the next episode, which will be out in the first week of August. In the meantime, be sure to follow at SY Adventurers on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. And make sure you keep an eye on both the SY Adventurers Instagram and my personal one. Next week, I will be having some uh, fantastic adventures in Colorado. The folks at Outdoor Mindset have given me a grant to head over there and attend their summer summit. So I will be hiking at altitude. I'll be doing some mountain biking with Jake Quigley and also going to their adventure film evening. If you want to know more about Outdoor Mindset, make sure you go and listen to Jake Quigley's episodes. And if you are able to get to Dillon in Colorado, you can join us on the 3rd of August for the summer summit yourself. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, leave a review and share the podcast. And if you do want to support in a more financial way, if you head to the Seizure Adventure website, there is a shop on there. You can buy some merchandise. There are things like enamel mugs, journals. There is also a place to just make a donation. So if you are appreciating what I'm doing, um, please do consider donating. Just to end today, I wanted to remind you that all the stories presented on the Seizure Adventure podcast reflect the personal experiences of the contributors. Neither myself or the contributors can advise or take responsibility for any individual decisions made about adventure sports or medical conditions. The music in this episode was by Kev Rowe on SoundCloud and Cunning Gnome on freesound.org. Thank you very much, both of you. That is all for today and until next time, safe adventures, everyone.